the New Testament book of Acts. If you're new to the scriptures, what I've always, like when I taught in the senior center, I, especially to them, I asked them to, during the week to make a card from the index of their, in their Bible there of where every book, what page number the books start on so that when we look at scriptures, and we do look at a lot, and there's an opportunity to look at several today, and, and some you, it might just be too quick for you to get to, but anyhow, if you, if you use the index of your Bible to help you find some of the books, so you might put a little marker there so you can find these, and then uh, you'll see how we use the Bible and let the Bible develop itself, put itself together, and, and show you some things that are happening. Yeah, in, in Acts chapter 27, we actually, way back in Acts 22, Acts is a historical book. Now, one of the things that I'll remind you about in, in a second again is that the purpose of the book of Acts is really an indictment against the nation of Israel. It shows the fall of the nation of Israel, and then as Paul goes out to the Gentiles, he first preaches to the Jews, but he does that to show, actually demonstrate their blindness and, and God's... Uh, rightness and leaving them and turning to the Gentiles. Now Paul's apostleship to the Gentiles, the doctrine that God gives him for the Gentiles, you read in Paul's epistles. Luke writes the book of Acts and he's actually writing it as an indictment against the nation of Israel, but uh, ever since Acts chapter 7 there was a, there was a fall of Israel in, uh, in that God's offer to them of their promises and the continuation of him dealing with them ended. And then after that, God uh, raises up Saul of Tarsus, makes him Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles, and sends him out. And, uh, and so, but anyhow, in Acts chapter 22, when Paul came back to Jerusalem, they ended up resenting him. He's under arrest, and from that from chapter 22 to chapter 28, I just label that whole section, is Paul in custody, and uh, in Roman custody. Uh, first, he's in custody in Jerusalem, where he was first... There was a riot, and he was first brought into Roman custody. Then they transferred him over to Caesarea, and that's where we've been following him for the most part. He's been in custody in Caesarea for several years. In Acts chapter 27, he's in custody, but on a voyage to Rome, because he had appealed for his right to have his case tried by Caesar. And because he is a Roman citizen, that, that right is going to be fulfilled, and so he's going to be transported from Caesarea to, to, uh, to, to the city of Rome itself. And, and then uh, in Acts chapter 28, about verse 16 and 17, he arrives in Rome, and so the, it'll end with his custody, uh, being in custody in Rome. He'll be left in prison. Uh, he has some freedom. He's actually in house arrest, as you end in the book of Acts. Eventually he goes furthermore where he's actually in a dungeon in prison. But uh, the book of Acts will leave the Apostle Paul in custody in Rome, and that's how the book ends. Now, I'm going to do a little introduction to the book of of uh, uh, to the chapter 27 in an interesting way that's not really the point of the book of Acts. Here's what I mean by that. If you kind of get a little ahead of ourselves, if you look over at Acts chapter 28 and look at verse 20, Paul eventually makes it to Rome, and when he's finally there, he calls the Jews that are in Rome together, and he's going to talk to them about Jesus Christ, and they're going to reject that message. And he's ultimately going to say for the third time in his ministry, uh, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. The point is, as God already told Paul, they won't hear your testimony concerning me. That was in Jerusalem. There are some Jews that do join the Gentiles out in the world as Paul went out there. But this is the reason I read that to you. This is the final indictment against the nation of Israel where, Paul, where it started in Jerusalem now has reached the whole world. And from this point on the, in your Bible, you got the book of Romans where Paul is writing to believers in the city of Rome, the, the, the capital of the Roman Empire, and... Uh, and, and uh, establishing them in the faith. And, and that being that he's writing, as he says in Romans chapter thir 11, verse 13, I write unto you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of Gentiles. So you end up with Acts 28, Israel's now off the scene completely, and the book of Romans, you pick up with what is this message that God gave to Paul. Now, Romans was written like in, back in Acts chapter 20, but what God had revealed to Paul, the message given to Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles, what is that message? Well, now you start reading Paul's epistles and finding out what that is. Look also with me to Acts 28 and verse 20. Because when he gathered those Jews together, as he began to preach to them, he made a statement, which is 
uh, consistent with what we've been studying. It shouldn't surprise you at this point, but it says, For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you, to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel am I in bonds with, uh, in bo- am I in bound with, the, with this chain. So when he calls the Jews together, he says that for the hope of Israel, he's in bonds, as he's a prisoner there in Rome. But hold your place there, and look, and, and by the way, we'll be back at Ephesians, so, but look at Ephesians chapter 3. So if you've got an extra piece of paper or a bulletin there, put it in Ephesians 3 so you can get back there. Paul writes, while he's in Roman prison, the book of Ephesians. Like I said, Romans, he wasn't a prisoner yet. That's all, that was written back in Acts chapter 20 when he was still traveling. But he writes the book of Ephesians when he's in prison. And I want you to compare that to Acts 28, 20, when he says for, uh, that, Because for the hope of Israel am I bound with these chains. He writes in Ephesians 3, 1, he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He tells the Jews I'm in bonds for the hope of Israel. Then he's sitting in jail and he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And, uh, and, and, and Israel did resent the fact that Paul had a Gentile ministry that provoked them to jealousy. That was part of his ministry to the Jews is actually to provoke them to jealousy by him turning to the Gentiles when they didn't want the message. Kept turning to the Gentiles three different times from Acts 13 to Acts 18 and Acts 28. He does that. And that's why I call the book of Acts an indictment against the nation of Israel. So I say this to tell you that when you're studying the book of Acts, you're looking at it from the Jewish point of view, an indictment against them. When you leave the book of Acts and look back, then you realize that God raised up the Apostle Paul for something new that's our benefit, our good. Now I, do that, I say that to you because my introduction to Acts chapter 27, go back there in verse 1. He says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and a certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And it's just a remarkable thing to stop and think, not from the Jewish point of view, he's he's on his way there, it's going to be indictment against the Jew. But for us Gentiles, it's a remarkable thing to think about that Paul's voyage to Rome. Because when it says, and when it was determined that we should sail into Italy... Long before Festus or Agrippa or any other Roman official determined that Paul should go to Rome, God had already determined Paul should go to Rome. In fact, we keep quoting uh, Acts 23, I think it's verse 11, where, where the Lord appeared to Paul when he was first put in prison and told him not to fear that as he has testified of him in Jerusalem, he's going to testify in Rome. So the Lord already determined that he was going to be in Rome. But even before Acts 23.11, the Lord determined that Paul was going to preach in Rome. And, and now the determination of Paul preaching in Rome, when, I, when I'm applying it here, I'm talking about what God determined before the foundation of the world. Here, this is an indictment about Israel, the fall of Israel. But yet, you know, you've got all these men making a determination that Paul, we're, going to give, we're now going to take him to Rome, but... The uniqueness of God's determination that Paul would make it to Rome and even in the writing of the book of Romans, what I'm about to say is actually a better introduction to the book of Romans, although I do want you to see this as Paul in Acts chapter 27. Uh, it's an interesting thing, this voyage and all the, the information about this voyage and, and like I said on Sunday, a lot of nautical terms and, and all. It's, it's, it's quite impressive just to read it in the historical count of what's going to take place in the voyage. But yet the, the, the very fact that there's, all the, there's going to be a shipwreck in this time, he's going to be in the sea, and then he's going to end up on shore, and later on in Acts 28 he even gets bit by a snake. But uh, All of that is that God had determined Paul's going to make it to Rome, and not just make it at Rome as an indictment to the nation of Israel, but as the apostle to the Gentiles, he will end up writing prison epistles that not only tell us that God has called us Gentiles to salvation, but the uniqueness of our calling is what you read about in those prison epistles. So, to, if you've never seen these connections, I want to point out to you um, that there is this, this determination that God made before the foundation of the world that's different than what God had determined since the foundation of the world. So, we're in the book of Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 3. You know that I 
edit forgotten truths. <laughs> I'm the one who, who considered the producer in the sense that after the programs are made, I'm the one who puts the, the verses on it, edits the time, it does all the editing that the program requires. And I don't know how many times Pastor Jordan uses these verses. I mean, I, I, just, <laughs> I just flash them up on the screen, just a, a routine. But just because he does it all the time doesn't mean I do it or that you've heard it all the time. So I thought, nah, you need to see these because they're really unique. In Acts chapter 3, as God, God as I say, the book of Acts centers around the nation of Israel, God has used the nation of Israel for a purpose that he had that's since the foundation of the world. We call it the prophetic program. And this is why. In Acts chapter 3, verse 20, Peter's preaching to Israel. And he talks about Christ, that they crucified Christ. He ascended back into heaven, but he's coming back. And it says in verse 21, Whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. In fact, if you look at uh, verse 24, it says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So the prophetic days, I mean, if all the prof uh, prophets are talking about these, the days that Peter is talking about, these are prophetic days. So this is the prophetic program, what God is going to accomplish through Israel as recorded in prophecy. And, and when it's recorded in prophecy, look again at verse 21. It's called the times of restitution because ever since man sinned, the world has been in disrepair. <laughs> and it's going to be restored. Even the lion and the lamb are going to eat together, not each other, not the lion eating the lamb, but actually eat together, straw. But, and so there's going to be a time of restitution that's going to come when Jesus Christ returns. But when Jesus Christ returns and does that, the time of restitution, it was spoken by, mouth, by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, compare that to Romans chapter 16. Because now here's what Paul writes about his calling and the purpose for us Gentiles. Romans chapter 16, that's the book after Acts, so it's, and then look at verse 25. It says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, so you can be established when you understand Paul's gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. When Paul preaches about Jesus Christ, he preaches him not according to prophecy, but according to a revelation of a mystery. Not according to what the prophet said since the world began, but something kept secret since the world began. We call that the mystery program. That's the age of grace in which we're living in today. Isn't that a unique comparison in that verse? So that Paul's purpose in coming to us Gentiles is not to fulfill God's purpose for the nation of Israel. They, they end up getting, that purpose gets postponed until God's accomplished His purpose today, and then God will finish His promises to the nation of Israel after the age of grace is over. Compare two more verses. This time get them both. Uh, get Matthew chapter 25, and then, I already told you to hold Ephesians, didn't I? But this time it will be chapter 1. And there are several of these that you could look at. Matthew 25, and then Ephesians chapter 1. Now, what's interesting is Matthew 25 is yet future. It, this is when Jesus Christ is going to come back. And uh, in verse 31 it says, Matthew 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. So this, is, this, this hasn't happened yet. So this is when Jesus Christ comes back in the second coming, and the first part of this chapter 25, he's, and he, when He comes back, He first judges the nation of Israel for their place in His kingdom. That is, the, the ones who endured to the end and are, are allowed to go into the kingdom. Now He takes the Gentile nations, and he divides them into sheep and goats. But he says to the one that on his right hand, he says in verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, when? 
from the foundation of the world. So from the time that God created the world, He was preparing a kingdom that in the second coming He's going to establish, and not only is the believing remnant of Israel going in, but even the Gentiles that are going to consider His sheep nations, they are going to enter into the kingdom that's been prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Look over in Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 3. It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. And that's Paul with us, believing Gentiles. He's writing to Ephesus, the believers there. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So we're not waiting for Christ to come back to earth. We're going to go into the heavens. According as he hath chosen us in him. When? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And, and so those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ and are in Christ, God has chosen us who are in Christ to be before Him and holy, holy without blame before Him in love. But He chose that those that were going to be in Christ, He chose that before the foundation of the world. So there's something that happened since the foundation of the world, from the foundation of the world, but there's something else that God kept secret before the foundation of the world and, and it has to do with us being part of the members of the body of Christ and our, our purpose in the heavens. So when you see that, you, you see some difference. The reason I say that is it's a remarkable thing then in Acts chapter 27 to think about Paul on his way to Rome. And like I say, what they determined that Paul should go to Rome, God had long before determined that Paul should go to Rome. I want to point it out to you in a different way, in a, in a prophetic way. You say, what in the world is that? <laughs> I try to color code it. <laughs> Some of you know what that is. <laughs> Go back. Uh, now, hold a place. We're in, we're in Acts chapter 27. I want to show you some uniqueness about about Paul going to Rome. So go to Daniel, the book of Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 2. Everybody likes to study Bible prophecy. You can't start with the book of Romans. Even when we taught the book of Romans, we did an introduction to the, when we taught, not Romans, the book of Revelation. When we taught the book of Revelation here, we did an introduction to the book of Revelation by doing a survey of Daniel. Because it prepares you for the, how God's going to bring Israel's program about. So what we're studying back here is from the foundation of the world, God has revealed to the prophets how ultimately Jesus Christ is going to come and set up his kingdom. Now in Daniel chapter 2, this, is, this picks up where the nation of Israel has lost their position as a great nation in the earth. God had, because they sinned against God, he put them into captivity unto Gentile powers. Nebuchadnezzar was the king. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream in chapter 2 that he can't figure out what this dream is about. God reveals himself through the nation of Israel, and one of the captives that he took and trained to be on his staff in, in Babylon is Daniel the prophet. And when Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, Daniel has the interpretation to the dream. And that's all we need to go to. So if you look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 37, here's what God determined from the foundation of the world. He says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had this nightmare. <laughs> he had a dream. It wasn't a nightmare. If you saw this, it's a nightmare. <laughs> but what he dreamed, he saw this image. And I laid it out so that we could actually do it like a timeline. He says that Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is the head of gold. And, and in this dream, he saw this image. It had a head of gold. It had uh, uh, arms and, and breasts of, of silver. It had belly and thighs of brass. It had legs of iron and a feet, part iron, part clay. And what God is pointing out here to the Nebuchadnezzar and through Daniel is that 
the Gentile powers that will rule until Jesus Christ. And this, I couldn't make a big enough stone. This is a stone coming out of heaven that's going to destroy, this, these feet are going to be eventually the Antichrist kingdom, and Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom on this earth. His kingdom on this earth is what the prophets have been talking about since the world began. And, and so it lays it out here how that's going to happen. I want you to see some of what those powers are. Look at verse 39. It says, After thee, so after the Babylonian Empire, shall arise another king inferior to thee, and a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now, you can take the book of Daniel and find out that the, that the uh, arms and the uh, uh, breasts are the media Persian empire that conquered Babylon. The brass is Greece, the Grecian empire under Alexander the Great that ruled. And then after that, Alexander the Great, his kingdom is broken up into four and eventually merges into Rome. And that's, that's when Jesus Christ comes on the scene during the time the Roman Empire rules. What I want you to see is this fourth. The Bible never says there's five kingdoms. It always says there's four. But there's an interruption in Rome in time past when Jesus Christ walked the earth from the future. If you look at verse 40, it says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron mixeth, uh, breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all things, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as, as thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the toes and the feet. Now, did you see how it starts talking about the legs? And if you can't tell, that's, <laughs> that's a pair of legs there. <laughs> he starts talking about the legs of iron, but then it starts talking about the feet and toes, part iron, part clay. As if there's two parts to the fourth empire. And, and the, the point is, is we're studying here. Well, let me first point out this. Hold your place in Daniel 2. Look over in Daniel 9. Daniel also gives some timing of when the Messiah will come. I'm not going to show you the timing. I just want to show you the Messiah will come and what will happen to him when he comes. Daniel 9, 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the walls even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off but not for himself. And then it talks about the people, the prince that shall come, shall destroy the city, and so forth. Jesus Christ taught in Matthew chapter 23 about what's going to follow him is the destruction of Jerusalem. When it says the Messiah shall be cut off, that's a reference to Jesus Christ going to the cross. And that verse says he wasn't cut off for himself, was he? He was cut off for the nation of Israel. Uh, Isaiah says he was cut off from my people. He, Jesus Christ died during the time of the Roman Empire as the payment for, the na uh, for, 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 for man's sins. First, he's dying for the nation of Israel to bring in the kingdom, but as we now know, he died for the sins of the whole world when he died on that cross. But I want to point out to you, it's during the time of the Roman Empire that Jesus Christ died. If you look over, go back to Daniel chapter 2 now, He says in verse 42, and as, the toes of, uh, and as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with the, with the clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, all the Gentile powers, all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. Jesus Christ is the stone. And that it break in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay, the silver and gold. The great God hath made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So the first coming of Jesus Christ, he dies on the cross. The second coming of Jesus Christ, he comes and destroys the ten-toed uh, 
king, uh, Antichrist kingdom at his second coming. So you see both comings of Christ in, in those verses, don't you? What you don't see is this little break in time here. <laughs> You don't see what the prophets... This has all been what the prophets have talked about since the world began. But God interrupted after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when He stopped dealing with Israel, as we've learned in the book of Acts, the fall of Israel. God interrupted that, raised up Paul, made him the apostle to the Gentiles, and began the age of grace, which was called a mystery, not known before, kept secret since the world began. God's doing something here that's interrupted the time that Jesus Christ came the first time between the time that Jesus Christ will come the second time to fulfill all that's in the prophets. Now, the reason I say that is Paul's on his way to Rome. Interesting, the place, the fourth empire, and it didn't say there was going to be a fifth, it says the fourth. The place that, that would have been the Gentile power that would have became the Antichrist kingdom is the place that the Apostle Paul is raised up to be an ambassador of grace and peace. He's heading to Rome. He's going to stand before Caesar. We know in here it's the purpose of indicting the nation of Israel. When you read Paul's epistles, he said all, all that in the palace got to hear the gospel. All in Caesar's household is going to hear the gospel. So that... He's on his way to Rome and interrupting Israel's program instead of wrath, Jesus Christ talking about coming and destroying them in his wrath, he, the Apostle Paul goes an ambassador of grace with a message of grace and peace. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11, it says when Jesus Christ comes, he comes in wrath to make war. Paul's message is in Romans chapter 1, look, well, Romans chapter 1 verse 7, it says grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wrath and war, grace and peace, the opposite of each other. And, and so as you know, they determined that Paul should go to Rome, but long before that, God determined even before the foundation of the world, world that something different was going to happen in Rome through the Apostle Paul, and as explained in the book of Romans, not so much in the book of Acts. That's the time in which we're living today. There's also something else that Perhaps you should see. Um, yeah, do it this way. Get Matthew chapter 5, and then get Revelation chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 5, in verse 34, let me get Revelation 2 so I can do that with you. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus Christ, you know, he, in the next chapter, he's going to actually tell them to pray and, remember, and to pray this manner. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, or in earth as it is in heaven. But as he's talking to them on the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 34 of chapter 5, he says, But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jesus Christ will come back and become king of kings and lord of lords on this earth, and he's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, where David reigned, and that's where Jesus Christ, when he sets up that kingdom, it's the city of the great king. In your Bible, there is this tale of two cities, as some people have called it. Because you realize, well, you can go back to Genesis and you start tracing, there's this Melchizedek, uh, a priest of the Most High God from Salem, which eventually is Jerusalem. And then you realize, there, way back there, even, even hidden in the book of Genesis, is the city of God called Jerusalem. It's the city of the great king. But when the Gentiles fell, and God turned to the nation of Israel and started making the promise of the land that they're going to inherit and, and the throne that, of David that Jesus Christ will come and reign at, there is another city that seems to be the city of the devil. And in Genesis chapters 10 and 11, it's called Babylon. And that is where the Gentiles built a tower and a city, but the tower whose top might reach unto heaven 
And that's where they formed idolatry, the worship of the stars rather than the worship of God. And that's why God cut off the Gentiles and raised up the nation of Israel to be a light to the Gentiles. So there's a city of God, which is Jerusalem, and there's this Babylon city. you got Revelation 17. Now, I'll tell you this because I don't want to read all the verses. It's just, it's just a thought I just wanted to share with you. Revelation 17 is actually going to be talking about a spiritual Babylon. And then in, in Ch Revelation chapter 18, that spiritual whore Babylon is actually a city, which will be Babylon. But, but look at the introduction to it. Roman, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And there came out one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show, uh, come hither, and I will show thee the, the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And when the kings, uh, with, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and that is spiritual fornication, uh, uh, lining with her and, and, and her God rather than uh, the true God, and the inhabitants of the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of, uh, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now that's earlier described as the, the Antichrist kingdom there. It says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was written the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. We know that the Antichrist is not only going to be a political figure, he's going to be a religious figure. He's going to actually try to cause the world, force the world to bow down and worship him as God. So you have the tale of two cities, you have it going all the way to the end. Jesus Christ is going to destroy his kingdom and set up the Antichrist kingdom, and set up his kingdom that will never be destroyed. When Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom, it will be in Jerusalem. Antichrist is going to establish a kingdom in Babylon. So, over there in uh, Iraq. So, it is Iraq, yeah. Uh, so, anyhow, that those are the two different cities. What's interesting is, a lot of times when people read Revelation 17, they don't see Babylon as being literal, because there is a mystery Babylon in that statement. They've always realized that ever since the age of grace, the gospel of grace has gone out, the enemy of justification by faith has been in Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. And they see those colors and all, and they start attributing that to the Roman Catholic Church. And, and sometimes they're so determined that they think that the Antichrist is going to come out of Rome. And, uh, but anyhow, my point is, in prophetic scriptures, the cities of Jerusalem and Babylon... But now, here God sends the ambassador of peace to Rome. And, the, and the, throughout, Paul, when he writes 2 Timothy, he says, The mystery of iniquity. Now, we know this mystery of the age of grace. But the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken away. And the mystery of iniquity is Satan is working in the age of grace. He's not just working in the prophetic program. And Paul says, even as he goes out and establishes churches throughout the whole world, Satan is out there spreading the mystery of iniquity. And what has spread the abomination uh, in the age of grace has been, since the Dark Ages, the, the Roman Church in the 400s and all of that. So it, my point to you is that in the age of grace, you see how Rome has an evil part, and yet God has a message for, for the city of Rome, which represents the whole Gentile world. And in the age of grace, Paul established Gentile churches throughout the whole world, and yet there's an influence coming out of Rome that perverts all of that. Interesting concept. All of that just because when I refer to that first verse, I'm thinking, Paul, going to Rome. <laughs> that brought a lot of thoughts to my mind that I wanted to share with you. So go back to Acts chapter 27. You realize none of that is there in the book of Acts. That's knowing other scriptures and desiring to share those things with you. In Acts chapter 27 here, what we have, and, and we'll just kind of like, we won't even cover it in depth, but we have, the, uh, we have in the first five verses, what, 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 you, what you're going to see, the way I broke chapter 27, uh, when I call the voyage to Rome, verses 1 through 5 is the voyage begins. You'll see in verse 6 there that they, they have, there's a, a, 
a switching of ships and all, and then the voyage continues. So that's verses 6 through 8. Then in verses 9 through 13, it, there's a decision time they have to make concerning the voyage. And then in verses 14 through 20, they suffer the consequence of their decision. <laughs> that's how the chapter's broken down. And then, uh, then when it looks like they're going to all die in a shipwreck, then the Apostle Paul has words of truth and hope for them. And those are in verses 21 through 26. And then you actually see their salvation. In the, in the sense of physical salvation from, from, from dying at sea, in verses 27 through 44. There's spiritual lessons in that. If just by using those words, you can see that. Then in chapter 28, they, they eventually will arrive safely at Rome, but it takes verses 1 through 16 before they finally arrive there. So that, that's kind of how, how we're going to study the chapter in those um, seven scenes as you go through from chapter 27, uh, verse 1, to chapter 28, verse 16. And, and one thing I can point out as well before we get into actual verses, notice how the time is going to be labeled out for you. For instance, in verses 1 and 2, let me read verses 1 through 5 so you get a little bit familiar with the book, the chapter. It says, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band, and entered into a ship of added rhythm, uh, and we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we launched at Sidon, the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul, gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary, and when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lysus. And then now they're going to switch ships at that point. Next week, we'll have a map up. We'll travel with, with see where these cities are and, and where they're at. What I want you to see so far just in this, in verses 1 and 2, they get ready to go, right? Verse 3 says, and the next, it says, and the next day we touched at Sidon. So they take off, and then all of a sudden it immediately tells you the next day. When you get down to verse 7, it says, and when we had slowly sailed many days. <laughs> so it starts out kind of fast. They're moving along real good. And all of a sudden it slows up. Many days go by. Look at verse 9. It says, now when much time was spent. <laughs> so things are really slowing up here. And then it says in verse 14, it says, but not long after there arose a certain, uh, there arose against uh, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euclidon. So they finally, after much time had passed, they set sail again, and it didn't take long before they're in big trouble, and we'll study that. When they get into big trouble, you're down in verse 20, uh, 20, it says, And when the sun or stars in many days, uh, and when neither the sun or, nor the stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest laid on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. <laughs> So you, can, you, you get an idea just reading these verses, what's coming up here. In verse 21, he talks about there's been long abstinence. These guys have been working, trying to stay alive. They haven't been eaten. In verse 27, it talks about, uh, it, it talks about 14 days passing, uh, another 14 days where all this drama is going on. Even when you get over into chapter 28, uh, he, they end up on land and three days goes by. But look at 28, verse 11. And after three months, were, uh, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isles, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. So, so eventually they get to land safely, and it's not till three months can they sail again. So you started out looking like things were going to move pretty quick, and then it doesn't, and it becomes disastrous, and they're lucky to be alive. And then they end up on an island, Melita, is where they're going to end up, and then finally they're going to arrive at Rome in, in verse 16 of chapter 28. So uh, that, that eventually gets us started. Let me just say, in, uh, it, I'm not going to name the people except for one person here. It says, again, back in verse 1, And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul, so you got Paul going into the ship, and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius. Now Julius is a centurion of Augustus's band. So, so, this man, he's a captain of a hundred soldiers, but when it says a centurion of Augustus's band, he's not just any centurion. 
He is like a bodyguard at times to Augustus himself, Caesar. And now here he's assigned to be Paul's bodyguard to make sure Paul arrives at Rome. So this is quite an influential man. But there's Paul, there's other prisoners that are going, but did you notice who else is going? It says that when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, who's we? Luke. Luke. <laughs> we haven't seen Luke for several years. All the time when Paul got to Jerusalem, we haven't seen Luke there. When he was in Caesarea, we didn't see Luke there. But now when he's ready to leave Caesarea, all of a sudden Luke had showed up on the scene and will travel with the Apostle Paul, and, and also it's it names later on Aristarchus, will travel with Paul to Rome. Luke is that beloved p- physician. He's the writer of the book of Acts. You see him pop in and out of the scenarios when you read the book of Acts by following that word, we. Uh, I think it's chapter 21. We'll close with this. Um, where did I see it last? Yeah, 21 verse 17. That's the last time I, I, we've seen this, where it says, And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So, Luke traveled to Paul to Jerusalem. That's where he's going to get arrested. He'll be arrested in Jerusalem. He'll be arrested for years in Caesarea. And now he's on his way to Rome. I don't know, was Luke there that whole time and just never mentioned? Or while Paul was in prison, did Luke go back? He's probably from Troas. Did he go back home? And now that Paul's leaving and going to Caesarea, I don't know. I just know that Luke joins up with the Apostle Paul and will be part of this voyage, (laughs) which is going to be quite a dangerous voyage. And uh, we'll pick up on that as we continue our study next week. But thank you for allowing me at least to do an introduction (laughs) to the chapter, an introduction that's not really in the book of Acts, but an introduction that is quite unique when you think of Paul, the ambassador of grace, being sent to Rome. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your grace. And and while it's in Paul's epistles that we find that truth, we certainly can't help but rejoice in it and look for every opportunity to point it out and and, uh, rejoice in the fact that you interrupted your program, your prophetic program from the foundation of the earth to accomplish something that you kept secret from before the foundation of the earth that involves our salvation today and your purpose for us in grace and, uh, and even a message to the world today that rather than uh, wrath and, and war that you are extending to all of mankind grace and peace all because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that allows such grace from you to flow to us. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Oh.